on such a beautiful day, I, I thank all of you for coming to this memorial service to honor the uh, men from New Bedford who served in the uh, Union Army and Navy to keep this country one and to help free people from slavery. The uh, Roundtable, which uh, offers uh, lectures every month, is um, really proud to be able to offer this memorial service for the men who have served so bravely. Uh, at the end of our season, this really is a, uh, an important event for us. And uh, while this is the eighth year that we've done it, I don't think any of us realized uh, how significant this would be for ourselves. And I think for the people that attend it. And so without any further delay, why don't we begin our services? And they will begin with a flag raising and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Gentlemen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, divisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll now have Father Powell from St. Lawrence Church do the invocation. Father? Memorial Day was established in 1868 as a day to honor the fallen soldiers of the just concluded Civil War. Today we gather to honor the sacrifice of all those from New Bedford who gave their lives to preserve the Union and to free those bound in slavery. And so we pray, Holy One, we gather in your presence as a community in solemn remembrance of those who have given their lives in the service of our great country. We remember loved ones and those who may be strangers to us. Each of us in our own way reaches out in prayer and supplication, seeking your solace and consolation so that we might be agents of compassion and grace to those who grieve. Amen. We'll now have Bob Lytle read General Logan's orders, establishing Memorial Day. Memorial Day was officially proclaimed on the 5th of May, 1868, by General John A. Logan, National Commander, Grand Army of the Republic, in his General Order Number 11 and was first observed on 30 May 1868 when flowers were placed on the graves of the Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery. And I'll now read order number 11. Headquarters, Grand Army of the Republic, Washington, D.C. The 30th day of May 1868 is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion, and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form or ceremony is prescribed, but Post and comrades will in their own way arrange such fitting service and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are organized comrades, as our regulations tell us, for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and Marines who unite to suppress the late rebellion. What can add more to assure this result than by cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead? who made their breasts a barricade between our country and its foe. 
Their soldier lives were the reveille of freedom to a race in chains, and their death a tattoo of rebellious tyranny in arms. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. All that the consecrated wealth and taste of a nation can add to their adornment and security is but a fitting tribute to the memory of her slain defenders. Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, testify to the presence, present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free and undivided republic. If other eyes grow dull and other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well, as long as the light and warmth of life remain in us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with the choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag they saved from dishonor. Let us, in this solemn presence, renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us as sacred charges uh, upon the nation's gratitude, the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan. It is the purpose of the Commander-in-Chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope it will be kept up from year to year, while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his dear departed comrades. He earnestly and desires the public press to call attention to this order and lend its friendly aid in bringing it to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for simultaneous compliance therewith. Department commanders will use every effort to make this order effective. By command of John A. Logan, Commander-in-Chief. In 1861, a poet and writer, Ethel Lynn Beers, wrote one of the most famous civil law poems of the era, and it's called All Quiet on the Potomac. All quiet along the Potomac, they say, except now and then a stray picket is shot as he walks on his beat to and fro by a rifleman hidden in the thicket. Tis nothing, a private or two, now and then, will not count in the news of the battle, not an officer lost, only one of the men, moaning out all alone the death rattle. All quiet along the Potomac tonight, where soldiers lie peacefully dreaming, their tents in the rays of the clear autumn moon, while the light of the watchfire are gleaming. A tremulous sigh of the gentle night wind through forest leaves softly is creeping, while the stars up above with their glittering eyes keep guard, for the army is sleeping. There's only the sound of the lone sentry's tread as he tramps from the rock to the fountain and thinks of the two in the low trundle bed far away in a cot on the mountain. His musket falls slack, his face dark and grim. He grows gentle with memories tender as he mutters a prayer for the children asleep, for their mother. May heaven defend her. The moon seems to shine just as brightly as then that night when the love yet unspoken leaped up from his lips, when low murmured vows were pledged to ever be unbroken. Then drawing his sleeve roughly over his eyes, he dashes off tears that are welling and gathers his gun closer up to its place as if to keep down the hot swelling. He passes the fountain and blasted pine tray. The footstep is lagging and weary, yet onward he goes through the broad belt of light toward the shade of the forest so dreary. Hark, was it the night wind that rustled the leaves? Was it moonlight so wondrously flashing? It looked like a rifle. Ah, Mary, goodbye. The red life blood is ebbing and splashing. All quiet on the Potomac tonight. No sound save the rush of the river. While soft falls the dew on the face of the dead, the picket is off duty forever. We're now going to have Mark Mello 
read the names of men from New Bedford who died in battle and where they did die. Charles Aiken of the 4th Massachusetts Cavalry died at Fort Monroe. Frederick Allen of the 20th Massachusetts died at the Battle of Antietam. William Bentley of the 38th Massachusetts died in New Orleans. George Booth of the 38th Massachusetts died at Halls Hill. John Booth of the 32nd Massachusetts died in Richmond, Virginia. Augustus Briggs of the 3rd Massachusetts Cavalry died of wounds received at the Battle of Cedar Creek. Obed Briggs of the 23rd Massachusetts died at the Battle of Cold Harbor. Joseph Campbell of the 54th Massachusetts died at the Battle of Fort Wagner. Stephen Christian of the 58th Massachusetts died at the Battle of Petersburg. Louis Coble of the 23rd Massachusetts died at New Bern. Timothy Cochran of the 28th Massachusetts died at the Battle of Chantilly. Charles Cowing of the 58th Massachusetts died at Salisbury Prison. Charles Crane of the 3rd Massachusetts died at New Bern. Lowell Edson of the 3rd Massachusetts Cavalry died at Baton Rouge. Henry Fitzsimmons of the 58th Massachusetts died at the Battle of Petersburg. Reuben Garlick of the 3rd Massachusetts Cavalry died at the Battle of Winchester. James Henry Gooding of the 54th Massachusetts died at Andersonville Prison. John Heinz of the 3rd Massachusetts Cavalry died at Port Hudson. William Heron of the 3rd New Hampshire Regiment died at the Battle of Nashville. John Hogan of the 28th Massachusetts died at the Battle of Antietam. And Hiram Howard of the 20th Massachusetts died at the Battle of Gettysburg. We'll now have our key, our, yes, our keynote address by the Honorable John Mitchell. Thank you, Joan. Good morning, everyone. This is, uh, I think, the largest crowd we've had at this ceremony. It's really great to see, and uh, we've really lucked out with the weather this morning. And I just really want to. Uh, begin my remarks by uh, offering uh, thanks to to everybody who was involved in organizing this. I know there were many, uh, Joe, of course, and all that you do for uh, for veterans in the city and to celebrate um, their sacrifices, uh, not just uh, those associated with the Civil War, but uh, but every war and, um, and and everybody else who was involved, Larry and uh, Pete Rio and Mark Mello, and I'm sure I'm missing some folks, but this is a this is a wonderful tradition uh, that uh, that we have here in New Bedford, and it's and it's uh, it's fitting that we do it right here. We are in the midst of those who uh, from New Bedford uh, who served in the Union Army in the Civil War, uh, our, our Union Army and Union Navy in the Civil War, and there is a uh, there is a special connection um, that New Bedford had to that war. Uh, that is, is uh, of course, uh, appropriate for us to, uh, to honor and to celebrate. Uh, if you picture New Bedford circa 1861, there was a bustling whaling port, an extremely su successful place, as we all know. And uh, young men, as they do, uh, as they have for uh, across the ages, uh, signed up, uh, not knowing what was uh, ahead, uh, but uh, they, were, they were doing it for for a particular cause and and for um, and and to honor uh, their their city their their nation and their republic um, and uh, and it is entirely appropriate fitting and appropriate that we uh, honor their sacrifice as we honor veterans uh, over the course of the weekend from from every war um, we give special attention to the Civil War for lots of reasons. Um, uh, the Civil War, of course, was America's largest bloodletting. Uh, some over 600,000 lost their lives in the course of four years, which is almost about as much as we've lost altogether in every other American war. 
Um, it was a, a tremendous bloodletting, a loss, a downright loss of uh, the country's population. Uh, it was that violent, and so it really it is singular in that way. But it also is in many other respects. Of course, uh, the stakes were quite high. Was, the, the republic was in peril, um, and we uh, today uh, look look back at it and almost think it's tempting to think that. The United States uh, was consecrated in the revolution uh, and, and that it would be so uh, in perpetuity. And the reality was that that was an open question in 1861. Uh, and so uh, when half of the country was breaking away and, and other parts of it were, uh, were threatened with breaking away. Uh, this, the war also stands out. Uh, because of the, the, the underlying profound moral question of slavery, that this great contradiction of a free republic, a free land, having uh, a large portion of its population uh, enslaved. It, didn't make, it, it, it was irreconcilable uh, and wrong, and even those who, who relied on slavery for, for, uh, for their livelihoods knew at some level that it was wrong, and so uh, the war in many ways was inevitable in that sense. But there's also one other thing that, um, and I think it's appropriate Memorial Day to, to recognize that uh, about the Civil War that was quite unique, and uh, and that was the uh, transcendent leadership of the president, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And I, and I, you know, it's funny as um, you know, as somebody who's been in a public executive position for a while, I, I've I've grown. Uh, I, I think to understand, to appreciate better, just uh, uh, just how why Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln was such a great president, and you're sort of in it, you sort of recognize. And I've always been a big uh, Lincoln fan, um, but as when you're sort of in a position, you start to think, oh wow, this is this is why he was that good. And uh, there were many reasons for it in terms of his uh, his his moral compass, his his uh, ability to think strategically and to be practical uh, and to get things done uh, under the most difficult of circumstances. But on Memorial Day, we focus uh, appropriately on something, so another of his gifts, and that is his gift of rhetoric. I mean, here's a person with very little formal education who uh, elevated political rhetoric to Shakespearean heights and really shaped the way that we talk uh, about uh, our republic and about the service of veterans uh, on, on days like this. If you're listening to Logan's orders, there's a reason why it sounds kind of like the Gettysburg Address in some ways, and that's because his words were so profound and so resonant. And so today we read, as, as we often, as we always do, uh, the Gettysburg Address, um, and a, a speech that is widely considered to be the greatest speech in the English language. Uh, and we read it uh, because, because as then, uh, as, as it does today, it gives meaning to the sacrifice of those who serve uh, in ways that uh, are, are relevant today, as, as, as relevant today as they were in 1863. Um, what he was in, in, in the midst of at that point was trying to, uh, he was attempting to, to make sense and help the country make sense of uh, the sacrifice not just of the young men who died at Gettysburg, but uh, all, everyone who was serving. Why, why, the, why did it matter? Um, and uh, at the end of the war, uh, he so eloquently stated in his second inaugural address, which is widely considered to be the second best speech in the English language, um, what we do next. And that is something that we uh, should also reach for on uh, Memorial Day as, as, uh, as well. Um, the second inaugural address attempted to, attempted to say to everybody, you know what, we can't, we can't be pointing fingers at, at everyone, at one another, and you know what, after 250 years of slavery, we all, we all deserve a little bit of blame, but we've got to move on from that. Um, so on this Memorial Day, um, I, I would like just to uh, recite something I recited as a, as a kid, and that's the last stanza of uh, the second inaugural address because it is widely considered to be a bookend with the, uh, the Gettysburg Address. And it goes, and many of you will remember it, and it goes like this. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and his widow and his orphan, 
to do all to ensure and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Thank you. We're now going to have Larry Bedell read the Gettysburg Address. Larry? In Gettysburg, in Gettysburg, uh, the, the governor of Massachusetts gave a two-hour speech to open, open the uh, event. And then uh, Abraham Lincoln gave his speech for two and a half minutes. And the governor came up to Abraham Lincoln when, it, when his speech was over and says, Mr. Lincoln, I'm going to cry. <laughs> Mr. Lincoln, you said more in two minutes than I said in two hours. So that's why it's my privilege to do this. Um, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived can, al can also uh, dedicated to, uh, excuse me, dedicated to, uh, to endure. We are met in a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place to those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot consecrate, we cannot dedicate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggle here have consecrated it far above all poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated to the, to here, here, to the unfinished business for which they gave the last full measure. I have this, have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be dedicated here to the great task remaining for us. Thus it is from that, oh God, thus is those honored in the dead when more will, Asked, task dedicated to the uh, cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. The way, the way we originally, uh, that we here highly does resolve that this nation shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people by the people and for the people and thank you accompanied by Larry Roy Caroline Blaze will now sing the battle hymn of the Republic have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. 
Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. We're now going to have Abby and Ruth lay the flowers with the assistance of uh, Mark Miller. The words are printed on the back of your program.
are now going to close with a benediction from Father Powell. God of grace and peace, we give you thanks for freedom and justice, for the opportunity to join together to build a better society for all generations to come. We give thanks for those, whether by choice or nor gave their lives for their neighbors. May the memory of their sacrifice live on in our minds and hearts. We come in a spirit of peace, remembering that war has many casualties. There are those who have died in battle, those who are left behind, their lives forever changed by the loss of a spouse, parent, child, friend, and comrade. We remember those who suffer as a result of war, injury, disability, mental distress. We pray too for those who are caught in the middle of conflict, for the homeless, the refugees, the hungry, and those who mourn their dead. Even as we pause to remember those who have died or who have suffered, we pray for our leaders of this country and for the leaders of every country throughout the world, that they might be guided by such wisdom that peace might prevail. Amen. The Roundtable cannot thank people enough for the wonderful participation that we had today. We are very grateful that so many of you came out on this gorgeous morning to participate in our memorial service for the New Bedford men who fought so bravely and some, unfortunately, that lost their lives. Our service is over. However, at that tent, there is coffee and donuts, and you're all encouraged to participate in that. Thank you very, very much. Have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Bye-bye.